Open your Bibles to Jonah chapter 3. Continuing right through Jonah, we will um, finish Jonah next Sunday, four chapters, four Sundays in February. So we come to chapter 3 today. I love movies where the worst character imaginable is redeemed at the end. Um, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Um, No, I don't think you understand. I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Like, I don't just watch the movies. I read the novels and I read the comics. They all fill in the story in between all the movies. Um, I keep up with literally every story they produce. Um, I've... Um, the, the story of Star Wars, particularly in the six movies George Lucas made, um, follow a pretty simple story. Um, Anakin Skywalker is discovered on a desert planet. He's brought to the Jedi Temple to be trained as a Jedi. But from the moment he begins, he struggles. He wants to be good, but he's constantly drawn to the dark side. And eventually he turns evil. He gives in to the dark side. He becomes Darth Vader. Darth Vader's a bad dude. I mean, he helps kill hundreds of Jedi, including children. He chokes his wife with the Force, which leads to her death. He leads the evil empire, terrorizing the galaxy for 20 years. Um, He will slaughter anybody that gets in his way. But before he turned evil, he and his wife gave birth to twins. One of them is Luke Skywalker. Luke grows up and becomes a Jedi as well, and he learns that Darth Vader is his father, and he chooses to try to redeem his father. He has one chance he confronts his father. If this goes south, Luke is dead, but he's going to try. And after Luke attempts to break through Darth Vader's evil heart, Luke is then tortured by the emperor, and Darth Vader finally learns to love again. He turns back into Anakin Skywalker. He kills the emperor and saves Luke, but it's such a struggle that it leaves Anakin near death. In his final moments of life, he has been redeemed. This evil man who killed Jedi children, choked the life out of his own wife, and exerted power over the helpless throughout the galaxy has been redeemed. You know, I think our heart craves stories like that. I notice that any time I watch a movie and the bad guy can, I mean, he can do the most terrible things throughout the entire movie, and you're watching and you're like, I hate this guy's guts, like he's just terrible. And then at the end, somehow he gets redeemed and turns good, and um, suddenly, like, compassion wells up in my heart, like, oh, okay, Uh, I'm really glad he turned good and and turned good in the end. In real life, I would be like, no, throw that scumbag in the, you know, throw him off a cliff. But in a movie, it's like, wow, I, I, I love that the bad guy's been redeemed. Jonah goes to Nineveh, and they're very much like the galactic empire led by Darth Vader. Um, they are an atrocious people. Remember a couple weeks ago, I told you all the, all the things that Nineveh and Assyria are known for. They loved killing people. They made it a, a, a hobby to just cover fields and corpses of people they defeated. They would burn 10-year-olds alive. They would pull out people's tongues. Like, these were bad people. And Jonah does not want to go preach to these people. He does not want to preach to them for two reasons. Number one, they might kill him. I mean, if he goes in there and tries to... Remember, these people love to kill people, so if he preaches to them that they're evil, they're going to kill him. But secondly, they don't deserve a chance of redemption in his mind. They don't deserve to have a chance to turn from their sins. But the last two weeks after his disobedience, he gets swallowed by the fish and spit up. He finally decides to go to Nineveh. And so we come to Jonah chapter 3. I'm going to read the chapter. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh. 
By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil ways and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Notice as you read Jonah, I've told you many times, a lot of words repeat and a lot of ideas repeat. Notice um, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Compare them with chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It, it's the same open page in my, in my Bible, so I can see them right next to each other. Compare them. They're almost word for word, except this time Jonah goes instead of refusing to go. The first time, Jonah's told, arise, go to Nineveh, and call out against their evil. The second time, he's told, arise, go to Nineveh, and call out against it the message that I will tell you. So a little bit difference in the message, but it's the same words as it's working through this. This is a second chance for Jonah. It's a second opportunity to do what he didn't do the first time. Despite Jonah's disobedience, we've looked at the last two weeks, Jonah gets another chance. He gets another chance to do what God said. God is the God of second chances. He doesn't give up on us easily. He gives us a lot of grace. He's always there ready to redeem us if we will come. He hasn't given up on you this morning. As long as you were alive, there's another chance for you. We're going to see that not just, not just through Jonah's story we're going to see this. We're going to see it through the people of Nineveh as well. Jonah goes to Nineveh. It's described as a great city. In fact, I believe it's um, uh, it's verse 3. It's an exceedingly great city. It's three days journey. That is, it was very large and it had a lot of people in it. But you have to ask, as wicked as these people are, why not just destroy it? Why does God want them preached to? They're a horrible, horrible people. Why not just pull a Sodom and Gomorrah on these people? Just rain fire down and incinerate these imbeciles. Why not just do that? Because God is greatly concerned about people, and there's a lot of them in Nineveh. There's a lot of them. If Jonah were God, Nineveh would have been destroyed a long time ago. Jonah's not God, and neither are you, and neither am I. I'm thankful he doesn't give us that power because we're a sinful people as Jonah was. The God of heaven is much different than Jonah, and he's much different than you and I. God wants to save these wicked Ninevites. He wants to see them redeemed. He wants their story to play out much like Darth Vader's of being redeemed and that feeling of compassion and joy welling up in you when you see them transformed, when their evil no longer defines them, but they have been converted and transformed into redemption and good. That's why God sends Jonah to Nineveh. That's why he does it, to see that happen and to teach Jonah what that looks like, to teach them what it looks like. This is a massive city. It's, it's a three days journey to walk through this city. It takes three days to walk from one side of it to the other side, which means it's a big city. I mean, it's big. Um, we, we may not think of that because we drive everywhere, but they walked everywhere. If you can walk three days and it takes that long to get through this city, it's a big city. Um, I played in band in middle school. I played the trumpet. Um, I didn't continue it in high school because I didn't want to go to band camp all summer. Um, but I played trumpet in middle school, which meant that we had to march in the Veterans Day Parade and the Christmas Parade every year. So one Christmas parade, um, one, one of the middle school years, um, we marched. It was freezing cold outside. Um, and so I'm like in a hoodie and a toboggan and, and gloves playing my trumpet. We get to the end of the line. My parents are way back at the beginning of the line. And so I'm ready to get out of this cold. And I'm not waiting for them, for the parade to end, for them to come get me. So I start walking back in the direction of my parents because I'm going to get in the car and turn the heat on, right? And so I walk, I don't know the distance, probably, probably the distance of maybe Food Lion to downtown Tifton, about that far. Um, I walk that distance in like 45 minutes, and my parents aren't there because Santa Claus has already come past, so they're on the way to get me. And so I have to walk 45 minutes back to where I was before, 
And I get there, and they are freaking out, thinking I've been kidnapped because we didn't have cell phones at that point. I made that journey, food line to downtown Tipton and back, in two hours. How much more could you walk through a city in a whole day? That's how far Jonah makes it. He goes a day's journey into the city. So three days to get all the way through it, one journey into it. He goes a third of the way into the city. So maybe he makes it, I don't know, 20, 30 miles into the city. That means when he stands to preach a sermon, he's not getting out of this thing if it goes south. I mean, if these people rile up and want to kill him, he's not getting out of here. He's got 20 or 30 miles to make it out of here, and then who knows how far to run before he gets to, you know, friendly territory. The fact is, Jonah hasn't changed. He hasn't changed. We know that from reading the rest of the book. You'll really see that next week when we hit chapter 4. He has not changed from his experience in the, in the fish. Jonah still doesn't want to do this. He isn't suddenly changed and now wants to delight in God and obey him. No, he doesn't suddenly love Nineveh. He still hates their guts. Remember, he had that decision on the boat in chapter 1 that he would, either, he would rather die in the ocean than go preach to Nineveh, so he chooses to get thrown overboard. It's almost like he got spit up on the beach, and now he's going to go do this and die in Nineveh, he thinks, just because God's not going to let him do otherwise. Remember the irony of Jonah. Jonah is nothing like the God he's supposed to represent as a prophet. He's nothing like, it. He's nothing like God. So here Jonah is. He walks into Nineveh. I don't know, maybe he had like a soapbox he was going to stand on. He stands up on the soapbox. He has probably just accepted his fate. He's going to preach this sermon and be speared to death. That's what's going to happen. They're going to cut off his head and put it on a stick, parade it around the city. So he's not really going to put any effort into this sermon. He's just going to say something and just let him kill him. So he stands up in verse 4, and he preaches, Yet 40 days, and Nineveh's going to be overthrown. And that's it. That's all he preaches. If you could read this sermon in Hebrew, which I, I really can't. I lost Hebrew the second I walked out of Hebrew class. But um, if you could read this in Hebrew, it's four words. His sermon is four words long. I mean, he stands up and gives the lamest sermon you've ever heard in your life. There was a young man in my home church when I was still there who felt called into ministry. He had to preach several times. And... Um, Every time he preached, it got worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, and one night he got to preach, and he got up and preached so bad, I mean, it was cringeworthy. I mean, he got up and read his passage of Scripture. He kind of mumbled through some explanation of the sermon, of the text, for about three minutes, and he prayed. Sermon finished. We got out of there at like 625 that night. No, I, I know Sunday night crowd might want that, but, but it was a bad sermon. Apparently, the pastor took him aside afterwards and said, that was awful. You will never preach in this church again if you're going to preach like that. Jonah preaches like that. I mean, Jonah just gives the worst sermon you've ever heard. He's accepted his fate that he's going to die, so he just gives it nothing. I mean, he stands there and literally just says, you're all going to die. All right, let's pray now. You're all going to die. That's it. That's all his sermon is. He tells them they've got 40 days, but he doesn't really tell them what to do. He just tells them 40 days left and you're done for. Kind of like those apocalyptic movies where they, where they find out that a, uh, you know, a massive asteroid is headed toward the earth and there's nothing they can do about it and they got 40 days or you know, a week or whatever to you know, do whatever they want and then they're done for. Like there's nothing they can do. It's, it's like that. That's how Jonah presents it. You got 40 days and then you're toast. So do what you will. He's not giving them any chance of helping themselves. He hates these people, but God loves them. Notice, this is very much a doom and gloom sermon. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. It's a doom and gloom sermon. Our day doesn't like doom and gloom. They want positive and encouraging. People scoff at doom and gloom. It's why if you watch a movie uh, that, that is, you know, into the world kind of movie. There's always some, you know, weird guy on the street corner with a cardboard sign that says, thy kingdom come. And kingdom is always spelled K-I-N-G-D-U-M-B. Like kingdom. This guy's dumb, right? Understand, always preaching hellfire and brimstone is not the proper way to preach, but 
Let me, let's get to the button just a second. My dad always says that the only kind of good preaching is hellfire and brimstone preaching, but the fact is people who love that kind of preaching don't want hellfire and brimstone preaching against their own sins. They want it against homosexuals and Democrats. They don't want it against gossip, bitterness, and gluttony. I preach the Bible, so when the text merits preaching hellfire and brimstone, I do it. But not all passages do. It'd be very weird for me to preach Psalm 23 and preach at hellfire and brimstone. It'd just be very odd. But the fact is, our day doesn't want any preaching about judgment, doom, and gloom. They want something to be uplifting. They want to walk away feeling better about themselves. That, that's why Joel Osteen has the biggest church in America, because all he preaches is how to be a better you and with a huge plastic smile on his face while he does it. Doom and gloom are necessary. They're necessary because the Bible offers doom and gloom from time to time. We must proclaim the joy and happiness that comes from knowing Christ, but we also must proclaim the great despair coming for those who reject Christ. We don't preach hellfire and brimstone to boast against evil like, ha ha, that's what they're going to get, hellfire and brimstone. No, we preach hellfire and brimstone to warn sinners that they might come, in, come running to Jesus to escape the hellfire. That's why we preach it. Remember, God loves Nineveh. He loves Nineveh. And he has Jonah preach, message, preach a message of doom and gloom because he loves them. And if they are not warned of what is coming, they will not repent. Look at the power of even the worst preaching. Because Jonah's sermon is absolutely lame. I mean, it's just, it's just a lame sermon. If I was his preaching professor, this guy wouldn't even do the children's story. Like, he's terrible at preaching. But look what happens. Verse 4. He called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believe God. That simple. He preaches this pathetic sermon, and it's just like instant response. Instant response. God does exactly what Jonah doesn't want, right? He does exactly what Jonah doesn't want to happen. He's ready, like he'd rather get speared to death by these Ninevites than these Ninevites listen to his sermon. That's what's going on. God, through the Holy Spirit, causes all of Nineveh to hear this crummy four-word sermon and repent. Everyone in the nation believes through the lamest sermon in history. Everybody in the city of Nineveh believes. This is why you need not fear in sharing your faith because you think you don't know enough. God can and will take the most lame preaching and use it to save sinners. When you share the faith with others, you don't have to preach a whole sermon with an offering and an altar call. You, you just need to learn how to name drop Jesus in conversations. My pastor in Kentucky used to say, speak a good word for Jesus when you're talking to people. The Holy Spirit uses that to open the hearts of people. I was saved reading a book I now theologically disagree with. I don't think it accurately teaches what the Bible says. I was saved using a book that God used a book that I don't think accurately teaches the Bible to save me. He can use even your worst attempts. You don't have to be an expert. Just open your mouth and speak of Jesus. Now look at the response to his sermon, verses 5 through 9. All of Nineveh responds the same way. They believe what God says, and they repent. They believe what he says, and they repent. I wonder, if you found out you had 40 days left to live, that's all you had, but you were going to be in perfect health the whole time, what would you do? You'd probably live it up. You'd probably have as much fun as you possibly could. You'd probably go skydiving and Rocky Mountain climbing in 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. I had to Google what Tim McGraw says there this morning because I didn't know the name of the bull, but they've got 40 days left, and they choose to fast and pray. That they choose to fast and pray. Verse 9, they, they, they do this and they say, hopefully God will turn and not do this to us. Hopefully we won't perish. Hopefully this is what will happen. Notice they put on sackcloth. All of them. They put on sackcloth. 
Um, it mentions sackcloth in verse 5, verse 6, and verse 8. If you underline in your Bible, go ahead and underline sackcloth in those three verses. They put on sackcloth. Sackcloth was something people would put on during times of mourning and times of repentance. It's meant to keep you from being comfortable so you would not lose focus. It's uncomfortable. It's essentially a potato bag. That's what they're wearing. It's itchy. It's not warm. It's no fun to wear. They all put it on so they will focus on nothing but prayer and fasting. They aren't just praying a couple short prayers during their day. No, they are praying nonstop. That's the difference in taking prayer seriously or not. What well, d- There are certainly times of offering up little 10-second prayers. I do that a lot. But does your prayer life have time of you spending lengthy periods of time in prayer? Praying for more than just the prayer list. Truly pouring out your heart to God, what is on your heart. I confess to you, that's an area I'm struggling in right now in my walk with Jesus. Um, I lose focus in my prayer so easily. More More often than not, I start praying and then I stare off into space And four minutes later, I'm like, oh, wait, what am I doing? That happens to me a lot. We must press on as hard as we can to focus in prayer for long periods of time. The greatest to the least put on sackcloth. Everybody, everybody in Nineveh does this. The least important to the most important. It makes it up to the king of Nineveh. The king hears about it. He gets off his throne takes off his royal robe, his nice you know, outfit that he wears as a king. He puts on sackcloth. The most important man in the city puts on a potato sack to wear. And he sets in ashes. Even the king repents. That's the irony of Jonah. Most of the time, a city like Nineveh does not repent like this. I mean, think of all the cities in the Bible that oppose God's people. Sodom and Gomorrah, Babylon, Egypt. Amalek, so many others in the Bible, they never repent. They always get destroyed. But God is trying to teach Jonah something and teach us something by saving Nineveh. There's a national repentance that happens. When the king repents, he issues a proclamation to the whole nation. The king issues this. He says, look, y'all need to do this. You need to um, get in sackcloth and ashes. You need to start praying and fasting. You need to truly seek this God because if you don't, if you don't do this, we have no chance of making it. He, he, he issues an, an order from his governing office to do this. You think of our own nation. Do you want to see America repent? Like, it's no joke, we're on a sinking ship right now. Like, it's not like we're on a comfortable cruise ship and there's just a few intruders on board. No, we're on a plane and it's going down, headed toward a crash landing, and everybody on board's going to get killed. I hope that doesn't happen in my grandkids' lifetime, but it's only a matter of time before either we destroy ourselves or God wipes us out. And it's only going to be by the act of God that that gets turned around. It's going to come through national repentance. So if you want to see America repent nationally, you've got to change your attitude about our nation's leaders. You're not going to like this part of my sermon. I'm just going to let you know. You've got to stop mocking President Biden and start praying for him. You know, 1 Timothy 2.1, Scripture calls you to pray for all those in governing authority. You're allowed to disagree with him. You're allowed to not think he's doing a good job as president, but you're not allowed to speak ill of him to get a laugh out of people. We're called to pray for him. It's really hard to mock somebody you're praying fervently for. Scripture calls us to honor him. 1 Peter 2.17, honor the emperor. Emperor of Rome, way worse than President Biden, I promise you. Do you have Jonah's attitude about our president or God's? It's the spirit of our day that if we disagree with someone, we mock them and poke fun at them. But God loves Joe Biden. God loves Joe Biden. He loves him. He wants Joe Biden, as he wanted Nineveh, to repent and be saved. Do you want that? Or would you be pretty okay with Joe Biden going to hell? If you want to see America repent, you must be praying that Joe Biden repents and that all of those around him in leadership repents. I can promise you the king of Nineveh was way worse than any of them, and God saved the king of Nineveh when he repented. As the great hymn, To God Be the Glory, says, the vilest offender who truly believes, 
that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. That the worst sinner imaginable, if they believe, receive a pardon from Jesus. Even more than just praying, though, for Joe Biden to repent or anybody in Washington, you must repent. You must live an active life of repentance. Genuine repentance is not so much about the act of repentance. It's not about, you know, it's, it's not simply about praying the prayer and sitting in the ashes. No, it's notice what the king gives them instruction to do. He doesn't just say pray and fast. You can pray and fast and never truly change your heart. It's not enough for you to s- simply feel sorry for your sins. You must turn from them. You must turn from them. You must put your sin to death. That's a radical change. It's not something that doesn't affect any of your life. No, it, it greatly affects your life. If you truly repent of your sins, you, your life will look different afterwards. It will cause discomfort. In fact, for a little bit, it may feel like an amputation when you repent of your sins and put them to death. Isn't that how Jesus put it, though? When he said in Matthew 5, 29, 30, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away from you. For it's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away from you. For it's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go to hell. That's radical. That doesn't necessarily mean literally cut your hand off, but it certainly means something life-changing, doesn't it? Listen to how Pastor Matt Chandler commented on those verses. Matt Chandler is a pastor in Texas. Um, I I listen to him every week. Listen to how he he put this verse. With these words in mind, with these words of Jesus in mind, about the hand and the eye, I now know that it is better never to hold my children again. It's better to never run my fingers through my wife's hair. It's better to not be able to brush my own teeth. It's better never to be able to drive a car. It's better to be paralyzed and never feel anything from the neck down. And it's better to have stage three cancer than to find myself outside of God's kingdom. It's better to never see the sunset or the sunrise, never to see the stars in the sky, never to see my daughter in her little dress-up clothes, never to see my son throw a ball. It's better never to have seen those things than to have seen those things and end up outside of God's kingdom. Repentance is hard. It's hard. It's not simply committing to try harder. It's not simply saying, I'll do my best not to commit that sin anymore. No, you'll always fail at that, I promise. It's life-changing. It's life-altering. It will hurt. You think of the movie Fireproof, came out in 2008. In that movie obviously about um, a marriage trying to survive. Um, The husband, played by Kirk Cameron, um, the the movie presents that he regularly looks at pornography, and that's just killing his marriage. So what's he do? Well, he doesn't say, all right, I'm going to put some blocks here on my computer. That'll keep me safe. No, no. He'll always bypass the blocks, and you will too. He rather takes his computer out in the yard and takes a baseball bat and crushes the thing. That's what he does. That's what repentance looks like. But I need the computer for important stuff. Doesn't matter. Find a different way to do it. Your soul's on the line. Repentance involves purging your life of the avenues by which you can commit that sin. So maybe, as I said, it's pornography, and you say, I can't get rid of my iPhone. I can't get rid of this. I need it to contact people. Okay, go down to Verizon, walk up, Turn in your iPhone and say, give me a flip phone, which you can still call and text people with. Your soul is on the line. Your soul is worth more than this little glowing rectangle. Repentance for the drinker is to purge the house of all alcohol and no longer drive past the liquor store on the way home, even if it takes longer and burns more gas in the process. Repentance for gossip means no longer going to the same hair salon, even though the person who has cut your hair there has been doing it for 20 years. Repentance for the homosexual doesn't mean they become heterosexual. It means they no longer act on the homosexual desires, even if it means being alone for the rest of their lives. Repentance for the unmarried couple that's sleeping together is to set a standard that we will not be alone in a private location for any reason until we get married. Repentance requires sacrifice. It requires sacrifice. It requires cutting off your hand and gouging out your eye, spiritually speaking. But Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. 
The king doesn't just tell Nineveh to go through the act of praying and not eating food. He tells them to turn from their evil ways, to no longer do those evil things. That's what he tells them. It's not simply about the act. Maybe if I come to church and throw some money in the offering plate, that'll fix me. No, it's about changing their heart so that doing those things means something. And notice verse 10, what what they say. Actually, verse 9. I'm sorry, I'm still in verse 9. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. He says, maybe God will relent and not destroy us. If we do this, if everybody changes their heart, if we all get on the right track spiritually, if we all turn to this God, maybe he won't destroy us. In other words, we have 40 days. Let's just try this. I mean, we got nothing better to try. Let's just try this. It's better than nothing. Maybe God won't destroy us if we change. Do you imagine that's what God's like? Maybe he'll forgive you. No, no guarantee that he will, but maybe. Maybe if I just do the right stuff, he'll forgive me. I hear that a lot from people. I just really hope God lets me into heaven. Like it's a technical problem. Like, you know, sometimes when me, Chris, and Sydney are in the sound room and there's something not working, I'll just tell them, hey, why don't we turn everything off, just unplug the power and plug it back in, see if that works. Sometimes it fixes the problem, sometimes it doesn't. It doesn't always fix it. What if you could have confidence that God will forgive you? What if you could have confidence? What if you didn't have to wonder if he will forgive you? Listen to the great description of God in Exodus 34, 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Now listen to these other verses of the Bible that echo that. Psalm 86, verse 5. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Psalm 86, verse 15, But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Joel 2, 13, Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Psalm 103, 8, Psalm 145, 8, Nehemiah 9, 17, Numbers 14, 18, 2 Chronicles 39, they all talk about how God is almost word for word, will forgive, he's gracious, merciful, Merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Can the Bible say it any louder and clearer? The Lord is merciful and gracious, and he abounds in steadfast love. If you repent of your sins, he will forgive. He will forgive. You don't have to wonder if it's going to work. It will work. He is a God that loves to forgive sinners. It's the essence of who he is. You must repent and return to him by faith. If you need any more of a case that God will forgive you, look no further than Calvary's tree. See the Son of God offering up his life for your forgiveness, that you may be forgiven of all your sins. Not some of them, not just the ones in the past, not just today's, all of them. Hear how Paul put it in the passage I read this morning, Ephesians 1, 7, and 8. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. He lavishes his grace upon us. That is, he never stops pouring it out on us in excess. Think of Psalm 23, my cup runneth over. I just can't get enough of it. In that moment when Nineveh does this, verse 10, God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, and God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. God relented. No longer would he pour out that judgment on their sins. Evil Nineveh, worse than Darth Vader, the one who slaughtered Jedi 10-year-olds, God forgives them. He forgives them. But you say, I just don't think God can forgive what I've done. I just don't think he can. Do you really need more examples? King David saw Bathsheba bathing on the roof. Bathsheba was the wife of his best friend Uriah. He took her for himself. Nine months later, she's pregnant. Had his, he had his best friend killed to cover up his sin. Well, he, he, he was confronted by Nathan the prophet. He repented. He was forgiven. Hear the words he said in Psalm 32. Um, Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven. I don't know what you've done. 
but I don't think you've had your best friend killed to cover up the fact that you got his wife pregnant while he was away at work. I just don't think you've done that. But even if you had, God forgives. God forgave David for that because he's a gracious and merciful God. The cross of Jesus Christ is there to announce to the whole world that wherever you've been, whatever you've done, there's mercy for you. So come. Grab your hymnal. I don't think I have one. Turn to number 28. I've already mentioned it in this sermon. 28. To God be the glory. Why don't you sing verse 2 with me? Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. The vilest offender who truly believes. The worst sinner imaginable can receive pardon from Jesus. Because God is gracious and merciful and he delights to forgive us. That joy I get when I watch a movie and the bad guy gets redeemed in the end. All of heaven knows that joy when a sinner repents. When the vilest offender repents. When Nineveh repents. When you and I repent, when anybody repents. Luke 15 says that a party is literally thrown in heaven over the rejoicing for a sinner repenting. So repent and come find his mercy at the cross where the fountain of forgiveness pours out in excess for you. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your grace and your compassion, your compassion and your mercy. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you help us all to know that mercy and that compassion, that we would um, continually find that forgiveness in your love. Lord, help us to forgive others in the same way and help us to um, fall more and more in love with Jesus for what he has done to, uh, for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now is your time to respond. I'll be here at the front if the Holy Spirit's moving in you to make any decision this morning. Amen. Go ahead and grab your hymn book again and turn to number 224. There is a fountain. Number 224, stand as we sing. Mm -hmm. 